Right, morning everybody. Good morning. Everybody fine? Yep. Yeah. So, I thought in the light of Mr. Trump being elected as President of the United States, and in the light of, of course, America being uh, the world superpower, seems to me it's worth having a little think about uh, the implications of Mr. Trump getting into power. Obviously, he's not really in power yet. When does he get into power? January. January, January the... 20th. Yeah. Clearly, uh, this man could seriously have an impact, couldn't he? Uh, especially on the Middle East. And of course, he's going to have an impact uh, at, back at home in, in, in America. I say back at home, in his home. We're not interested in Obamacare. We're not interested in his, you know, the tax situation of America. What we're interested in is what is Mr. Trump going to do, potentially, in the Middle East? So, I'm just going to show you a little video. Did you see any of the debates that, uh, that, that Trump was involved in? Yeah. So, there were loads of them, and most of them drive you to distraction because they're just shouting at each other. Here is him talking about, or answering the question about the Middle East, and uh, we'll just play a couple of minutes of this so you get, get an idea as to perhaps where he's coming from. Mr. Trump. In a 2012 debate, President Obama mocked Mitt Romney's assertion that Russia was the top geopolitical challenge facing the United States, saying he was a Cold War dinosaur. Now, Russia has invaded Ukraine and has put troops in Syria. You have said you will have a good relationship with Mr. Putin. So what does President Trump do in response to Russia's aggression? Well, first of all, it's not only Russia. We have problems with North Korea where they actually have nuclear weapons. You know, nobody talks about it. We talk about Iran, and that's uh, one of the worst deals ever made, one of the worst contracts ever signed, ever in anything. And it's a disgrace. But we have somebody over there, a madman, who already has nuclear weapons. We don't talk about that. That's a problem. China is a problem, both economically and what they're doing in the South China Sea. I mean, they are becoming a very, very major force. So we have more than just Russia. But as far as the Ukraine is concerned, and you could say Syria, as far as Syria, I like if Putin wants to go in, and I got to know him very well because we were both on 60 Minutes. We were stablemates, and we did very well that night. But you know that. But if Putin wants to go and knock the hell out of ISIS, I am all for it, 100%, and I can't understand how anybody would be against it. They blew it. up, hold it, they They're blew up, it. wait a minute, they blew up a Russian airplane. He cannot be in love with these people. He's going in, and we can go in, and everybody should go in. As far as the Ukraine is concerned, we have a group of people and a group of countries, including Germany, tremendous economic behemoth. Why are we always doing the work? We are, I'm all for protecting Ukraine and working. But we have countries that are surrounding the Ukraine that aren't doing anything. They say, keep going, keep going, you dummies. Keep going, protect us. And we have to get smart. We can't continue to be the policemen of the world. We owe $19 trillion. We have a country that's going to hell. We have an infrastructure that's falling apart, our roads, our bridges, our schools, our airports, and we have to start investing money in our country. Thank you, sir. Donald, Donald is wrong on this. He is absolutely wrong on this. We're not going to be the world's policeman, but we sure as heck better be the world's leader. That's a, there's a huge difference where without us leading, voids are filled. And the idea that it, it's a good idea for Putin to be in Syria, let ISIS take out Assad, and then, then Putin will take out ISIS, I mean, that's like a board game. That's like playing Monopoly or something. That's not how the real world works. You get the idea. And, of course, he's coming up with lots and lots of different things. We're going to have a look at this uh, in a second. But, of course, what we need to do is cut through all the noise and see what God says is going to happen uh, moving forward. Because quite often you'll get presidents say one thing, uh, events actually change, change things. Are you with me? So they say, this is what I'm going to do, and actually events come along, and it means something very, very different. So we can have a look at that. Uh, I think the first thing I was going to say is, uh, of course, it's God that's behind the leaders of this world. It's God that puts people in power, isn't it? 
And we know that because in Daniel chapter 4, verse 17, bless you, uh, it says, The Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world, and he gives them to anyone he chooses. A lot of religions don't really believe this or understand this, but God, it is, is the one who puts the leaders in power. That does not mean he is putting the most righteous person in power, does it? Sometimes they're despots, sometimes they're autocrats, sometimes they're totalitarian monsters, but actually God wants them in power because they're going to bring about his plan and purpose in a way that perhaps we don't fully understand uh, ourselves even, but he's the one moving the pieces around, and he knows I need America to go in this direction because that's going to weaken here, which is going to strengthen this person, which is going to bring them down into Israel and so on. So it, it's God that's in control. It isn't only the Old Testament that says that. This is Romans 13, verse 1. Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Now you don't get a lot clearer than that, do you? What does it say? Those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Therefore, when you look at the world and you see all the world leaders, they have all been put there by God, because that's what the Bible says. Including... <laughs> Mr. Crum. Oh my goodness. Right, so... Not many people thought that he was going to get into power, did they? You know, if somebody said Trump's going to get into power last year, you'd have said no chance. This is a, a, multi, yeah, he's a billionaire businessman, but he's never ever been elected. He's never ever been a governor. He's never done anything whatsoever in politics. What he did do was hijack the American uh, Republican system and pushed himself in. And suddenly we're going to have a president that's never done a single solitary thing in politics ever. So this is quite unusual. In fact, it's historic. Nothing like it has ever been seen. So it means nobody really knows what he's going to do. It's not like Reagan. Reagan, of course, was an actor in his younger days, but he did get elected and he was in politics for quite a long time before he became president, not, not this man. People have said, you're in a multi-billion pound empire. Are you still going to run that as well as be president? You're a businessman. Oh no, my daughter's going to run that. But you can see that actually nobody really has a clue as to what's going to happen. And of course, he's not used to the great big political machinery that you almost need to know how the machinery works. He hasn't got a clue. Not a clue about that. So, it's, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty as to what actually is going to come from, from this, which is why we have to cut through the noise and make sure we stay firm on the Bible, doesn't it? And say, hold on a minute, I don't really care what he's saying. I need to understand what the Bible says is actually fundamentally going to happen. I'm not saying we're not going to look at what he's saying, but we need to look at it through the prism of the Bible. Because the Bible, of course, well, God is interested in the politics. He's interested in nations. He's interested in nations that specifically are impacting the Middle East, and even more specifically are impacting who? The Jews. Absolutely. And Israel. So the Bible tells us everything in advance that God needs us to know and wants us to know about things that are happening in relation to Israel. And of course America most certainly does have an impact, doesn't it, on Israel. So, first thing we're going to do is have a think about where the United States appears in Bible prophecy. Now, there aren't many places, actually, where it does. Uh, but here is one of the key places where the United States of America, I believe, is mentioned in Bible prophecy. And I'm going to prove this to you as fast as I can, so that we can keep pressing on. So this is Ezekiel 38, 
verse 13. Somebody tell me, in a couple of words, what is Ezekiel 38 all about? Prophecy against Gog. Against Gog. Yeah. Excellent. Who's Gog? Russia. 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 Putin. Gog is the leader of the Russian people. Currently, of course, that's Putin, because he's leader of the Russian people. So Ezekiel 38 is all about Russia. And in Ezekiel 38, it talks about lots of different nations all invading Israel, of which Russia heads up. But there's some other nations with Russia. Give me a few of them. Turkey. Turkey is one. Iran, Iran is another. And that will do for now. There's, there are others like Ethiopia and Libya. But in this chapter, there is an opposing force to this big Russian invasion of Israel. And they are mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 13. And these are the guys, these are the nations that say, hang on a minute, what are you doing? This is what it says, look. Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, who's you? Gog, Gog Russia. Have you come to take plunder? <clears throat> Have you gathered your army to take booty, or spoil, as it says in the authorised version? to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder. So there's these group of people, whoever they are, called Sheba Dedan, merchants of Tarshish, young lions, whoever they are, that say to Russia and all these nations that have invaded Israel, what on earth are you doing? Have you come to take a spoil? Have you come to take goods? What, what's, what's going on? So, this is the, these are the opposing nations. Happy with that? So all we need to do is work out who Sheba Dedan, Tarshish, and whoever these young lions are, and that gives us the opposing force. Now, if you look on a, a, a map nowadays, you won't see anywhere that says Sheba and Dedan. But if you look on ancient maps, you will see where Sheba and Dedan are. So let's focus in on this map. Can anybody see on there... The word Seba. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's Sheba, look. Yeah. Did you see Seba as well? Yeah. 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 Uh, there. And on the left side. Oh, and over here. Yeah. Is that the same as Sheba? No. Sheba is here, look. There's Sheba. Yeah. No. Sheba is here, look. There's Sheba. Where's Dedan? It's Dedan. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Not far away. It's there. <coughs> so. Now, okay, there's different maps that show it's the, them in slightly different positions, but most of them will show it around this sort of area here. Now, what is this country here? Can you tell from that map? Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Sheba and Dedan are in what we now know as <coughs> Saudi Arabia. So the first group of nations that are mentioned as opposing what Russia is doing is Saudi Arabia. Happy with that? Tick. But then, what we also have, what comes after Sheba and Dedan? Tarshish, the merchants of Tarshish. Now, this is a whole talk in itself, which I'm not doing, obviously, right now. You're going to have to take my word for it. But Tarshish in the Bible means Britain. It is Britain. Every single solitary time that Tarshish is mentioned, cross it out, write Britain. Because it is. So, I haven't got enough time to give you any evidence of that, but please take it from me for, for just for now, that Tarshish is Britain. We know it because um, in different prophecies <coughs> in the Bible, it talks about what Tarshish was like and what it used to do. One of the things that ancient Tarshish used to do was to for trade for what metal? Tin. Tin. And at the time that Ezekiel was writing, the only nation that was exporting tin to, that, to the world at that time was this country. And the evidence of it is still down there in Cornwall, even now. So Tarshish. So now we've got Tarshish as Britain, which might seem weird because we've gone from Saudi Arabia to Britain of all places. This is weird. It's not like they're geographically in the same place. But then we've got something called what? There's Tarshish and young lion. the young lion. <coughs> now here is what we think the young lions are. 
The young lions are the offspring of Tarshish. So it says Tarshish and the young lions. The young lions are nations that <coughs> came out of Britain. Now interestingly, Britain is very, very often depicted as a lion. Not a young lion either, an old lion. If you go to Buckingham Palace, there's great big statues of lions all over the place, isn't there? All surrounding the palace, because this is the symbol of Britain. Now this isn't a Christian poster. This is a poster from World War I. And what it says on here is, All answer the call. Helped by the young lions, the old lion defies his foes. <coughs> That's quite interesting, isn't it? There's a poster, nothing to do with the Bible. It's saying, we're this old lion. We want the young lions to come and help us. Now, who do you think the young lions are? The overseas states. Now, who are the overseas states of Britain? Who are we calling? Who are we saying, come and help us in World America, War I? America, America Canada, Australia, 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 New Zealand. New Zealand. Maybe some of the Commonwealth, like India. Yeah. So can you see these young lions? The I mean, this is amazing. Ezekiel wrote all of this 600 years before Christ, said the young lions will be there as well. This has got to be a reference, therefore, to America, Canada, and so on. Now, out of the young lions, who is the most powerful? America. 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 So this has got to be something to do with Britain and America opposing um, Russia and what it's doing. Now, let me show you how all this comes together, all right? Because we sort of think, well, hold on a minute, Saudi Arabia, Britain and America and Canada and so on, how does this all fit together? Here's how it fits together. This is Saudi Arabia. There's two maps showing you exactly the same. So here is Saudi Arabia. Here is Saudi Arabia. Okay? And what these maps show you, and these were just taken out of the newspaper. This was taken off the internet um, a bit, bit earlier on today. It shows you the military bases that America and Britain have in, of all places, the, the Gulf area of Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and so on. Because obviously there's quite a number of these little countries like Amman, uh, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, United Arab uh, Emirates, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia. All of these are little countries, aren't they, around the edge of what we now know as Saudi Arabia. <coughs> and you notice there's all these bases, American bases and British bases in this very area. Do you see this? So... This is why the Bible has linked all these people together in Saudi Arabia, because it's saying Sheba and Eden, Saudi Arabia, and, Amer and Britain, and America, all in this area opposing Russia and the other nations that are attacking Israel. See that? Which is quite interesting, isn't it? So America and Britain and Saudi Arabia are going to oppose what Russia is going to do, which is to invade Israel. Israel. Now, so there's our marker in the sand. So whatever Trump talks about, we know that actually America is going to at some point stand against, to some extent, Russia coming down. When I say stand against, it doesn't really sound like they're doing a great deal, apart from saying, what are you, what are you doing, Mr. Putin? We don't really like the look of what you're doing. Are you coming to take a spoil? It doesn't say that they, they, they go and attack or, 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 you know, fight back, does it? It just says, what are you doing? So they're obviously in a bit of a weak position, not quite knowing how to deal with the situation. Does, that, does it sound like that to you a bit? So, let's press on. Let's have a look and see some of the headlines over the last few days in relation to what Trump says he is or isn't going to do in certain situations. This is taken from Al Jazeera. Uh, the headline is, what does Trump's victory mean for the Middle East? So that's interesting. What do they make of this? And this is what they say. Regarding foreign policy in general and the Middle East in particular, 
Donald Trump as the new President of the United States would stand out as the most unpredictable man to have occupied this position ever since his country started deploying an overseas <coughs> imperial policy in the late 19th century. In other words, <laughs> what the heck's going to happen? We don't really know. This, and the rest of the article tried to guess at what, 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 what potentially could happen. But here's some other headlines. So, top one up there, he mentioned this in that speech that we looked at, Iran nuclear deal could collapse under Trump. Trump has every intention of recognising Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Trump win puts US-Russia hostility on hold, but for how long? Because, of course, Trump's sort of saying, actually, uh, I want to be friends with Putin. So, but Reuters is saying, actually, OK, America and Russia look like they might be coming on side with each other a little bit, but how long is that going to last? And the other one we're going to look at is Donald Trump likely to end aid for rebels fighting the Syrian government. So what we're going to have a quick look at is, well, what is going to happen between America and Russia? Is Trump going to win America over? And are they going to be friends and put their arm around each other? Uh, what's going to happen with uh, Trump and Israel? What's his stance on that? We'll play a video of that. Uh, we're going to have a look at what's going to happen in Syria. And we're going to have a look at the uh, Iranian nuclear deal and what might happen with that. Happy with that? Fine. So first up is relations with Russia. So this is taken from uh, Reuters. This is what they said two days ago in relation to the situation between America and Russia once Trump gets in. After years of rising US-Russia tensions over Ukraine, Syria, cyber attacks and nuclear arms control, Donald Trump's election as US President <coughs> may offer a narrow window to repair relations as he and Russian President Vladimir Putin size up each other. But Trump's ascent to the White House carries the risk of dangerous miscalculation if the US President-elect and Putin to willful personalities and self-styled strong leaders who have exchanged occasional compliments decide they have misjudged one another according to Russian experts and others. So in other words, you know, basically there's Trump saying, I'm going to be friends with Putin, I'm going to do everything I can to come on side. Reuters is saying, that's all well and good. But we've got two very, very powerful, strong-willed personalities here that actually a hard negotiators, this could actually end up with some severe miscalculations and trouble. And I actually think that's pretty accurate. This morning on the Telegraph, there is, well it came on late, late last night, about 11 o'clock last night, was this headline in the Daily Telegraph, Trump-Putin alliance sparks diplomatic crisis. That's a headline from this country saying, because, Putin, because Trump's saying I want to be friends with Putin, our Foreign Boris. Secretary, Boris. Boris, and the rest of the government are absolutely on tenderhooks as to what uh, Trump is going to do in terms of cozying up to uh, Putin. And it says it's sparking a diplomatic crisis. And in fact, what it says in this report is that Britain is getting over to America as fast as they possibly can to tell Trump that he's going in the wrong direction here and they're going to do, throw everything at him to persuade him to treat Putin as the enemy, not as the friend. So, well, what does the Bible say about all of this? What does it say about US-Russia relations? So, let's have a look. Here, look, is Ezekiel 38, which we haven't read but you've already described it to me. This is talking about Russia and other nations invading Israel. So we've got this great big army, look, in verse 4 of Ezekiel 38 that come down, and there is Persia and Ethiopia and Libya as well. They come from the north. It all happens in the latter years or the last days. And where do they come? Against the mountains, Against the mountains of Israel. Now, the reason I'm showing you that is because I need to show you this over here. This is Daniel chapter 11. 
And in Daniel chapter 11, it's talking about exactly the same thing. So what I've done is coloured everything here and here so you can link everything together. So, for instance, it says here in Daniel 11, this thing is all going to happen at the time of the end, which is exactly the same as saying it's going to happen in the last days or the latter years. It says here, they're coming with chariots and horsemen and many ships, so there's this big army, which equates with the army and horses and horsemen over here in Ezekiel 38. It says that there's somebody called the King of the North, and over here it says that they come from the North. It says here that they come against the mountains of Israel. In Daniel 11, it says that they will come into the glorious land. That's got to be Israel, hasn't it? It says here that the Libyans and Ethiopians are part of the show. And over here it says Ethiopia and Libya are also there. So are you pretty convinced that these two are the same event? Now, where it gets interesting is, of course, in Ezekiel 38... It talks about somebody called Gog of the land of Magog, which we've already said is the Russian ruler. Gog is the Russian ruler, and that's him described here. Over here, it doesn't talk, of, well it does talk about the, the Russian ruler in verses 36 to 39. So this, this uh, bit here, verses 36 to 39, where it talks about the king doing according to his will, is talking about Gog over here. So these two bits line up as well. But look, it says at the time of the end, the king of the south will push at this man, who is Gog, and then the king of the north comes against the king of the south like a whirlwind. Who do you think the king of the south is? We've got the king of the north being Russia. Who is this opposing force that is the king of the south? It's America and Britain based where? Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Is, that, is Saudi Arabia north or south of Israel? South. south. You see, this is why it's called the King of the South. Because people have said to me, well, Britain isn't south. And America isn't south of Israel. Oh, yes, but they are. If you actually put them as the Bible does in Saudi Arabia. Which is where our bases are. So we've got the king of the north. So let's just go back to, to this just for a second. It says at the time of the end, the king of the south, which we now know is Sheba, Dedan, America, Britain, push at him. The him is Gog. Now, OK, so America, Britain, Saudi Arabia together push at the ruler of the Russian people. So I look at this word push in my Bible dictionary because I think, well, what does that mean? How, how, do, how does a nation push at another one? And here's what it says in my Bible dictionary. It says the word push means to thrust, to gore, to push, to engage in thrusting, to wage war. So something's going to happen, don't you think, where the king of the south pushes... Uh, attacks militarily does something to the king of the north to uh, Gog to the Russian ruler does that sort of make sense so something has still got to happen where there is some conflict between America Britain Saudi Arabia and Russia which means despite Trump saying, I'm going to be best mates with Putin, what actually is going to happen? It's going to go sour. We're going to see this. There is going to be some military conflict, <coughs> even if it's only on a minor basis. There'll be something that really gets the go to Putin. There's some calamity, there is some push, there's some military provocation. So Trump is saying I'm going to be best mates with him. Reuters is saying actually we don't really think this might work out because they're two willful people. This could easily end up in disaster. The Bible says it's going to end up in disaster. Therefore, 
I believe will end up in disaster. Trump's going to get something wrong here. <coughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. What about relations with Israel? Now this is quite interesting. This is what it said in The Guardian yesterday. Israeli government ministers and political figures are pushing the US president-elect Donald Trump to quickly fulfill his campaign promise to over overturn decades of US foreign policy and recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital and to move the US embassy from Tel Aviv, obviously, into Jerusalem. Now, Trump, I'm going to show you a video now of this, is very, very, very pro-Israel. In fact, I was listening yesterday, I was talking to, to, talking to Janice about this a few minutes ago, uh, Trump's own chil uh, grandchildren are being brought up in the Jewish faith. <laughs> so he's very, very pro-Jewish. Uh, let's just have a listen to this. This is somebody, uh, a reporter on CNN News, talking about uh, Trump and Israel. Israel's right wing very much celebrated a Trump victory and almost immediately after the election results came in, called on President-elect Donald Trump to move the American embassy to Israel from where it is now in Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. That would effectively be the United States recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital. That would buck the United Nations and decades of U.S. policy when it comes to Jerusalem. But that was a campaign promise of Donald Trump, and it's now those right wing leaders, including the Jerusalem mayor and Israel's uh, right-wing justice minister who called on Donald Trump to make good on that promise. Meanwhile, the education minister congratulated Trump and also said the era of a Palestinian state is over. Meanwhile, it was Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu who gave a much more measured, much more down-the-middle message. Here is what he had to say. President-elect Trump, my friend, congratulations on being elected President of the United States of America. You are a great friend of Israel. Over the years, you've expressed your support consistently, and I deeply appreciate it. I look forward to working with you to advance security, prosperity, and peace. Israel is grateful for the broad support it enjoys among the American people, and I'm confident that the two of us, working closely together, will bring the great alliance between our two countries to even greater heights. May God bless America. May God bless Israel. May God bless our enduring alliance. But that is quite interesting that actually he's so pro-Israel. Uh, but he's also talking about moving the embassy. So if you look at it, all of nations' embassies right now are all of them in Tel Aviv because it's a real hot potato to put them into Jerusalem. Why is it a hot potato to put your embassy in Jerusalem? Because it's a divided city. It's a divided city. The Palestinians say it's ours. So as soon as somebody moves an embassy into Jerusalem, well, hold on a minute, you're now publicly saying, therefore, that the capital city of Israel is Jerusalem. And it sort of tilts the balance, doesn't it? It tips the balance. So, well, what does the Bible say about Israel? And what does it say um, in relation to uh, America and so on? Well, um, the first uh, point is this, that as we know, there's going to be a big conflict over Israel at some point. And here again is Ezekiel 38 that we've just been looking at. And it's absolutely clear that Russia is going to come, it says in verse 8, against the mountains of Israel. So we know that there's a conflict coming over Israel. We know that Russia is going to come down into Israel. It's interesting that it says the mountains of Israel. Because the mountains of Israel run right the way down <coughs> Israel like a spine. Can you see that coming down here? But look, they're all of them pretty much in the West Bank. So actually the West Bank, which is the bit that the Palestinians say is our bit, is the very bit that actually is the center of this conflict. So, what Trump has said is, actually I'm quite happy for Israel to build as many uh, settlements as they like on the West Bank. It's their land, they can do it. You can see that this could start really tipping the balance. On the other hand, 
In Ezekiel 38, we're actually told what this man thinks. We're told his actual thought process. Because in verse 10, I think it is, yeah, it says, talking about the leader of the Russian people, which is currently him, Putin, it says, you will think an evil thought, and you will say, I will go to the land of unwalled villages to take a spoil and to take a prey. And as I've already shown you, it clearly says it's Israel, but where he's headed. So this thought process is going to go through Putin's mind. To be, far, to be honest, it might already have happened. He might already have thought this through and planned in advance what he's going to do. Because Russians plan things way, way in advance. But we also know the response to this, and the response to Russia doing it, is going to be this. Because in the very next verse, it says that Sheba and Eden and the merchants of Tarshish and all the young lions are going to say, have you come to take us for So Russia comes down having thought the evil thought. The next verse says, there's a group of nations that say, what on earth are you doing? So we now know what Putin thinks, and if Trump's in power when all of this happens, and he might be, that's what he's going to say. What are you doing? I thought you were my friend. I thought we were going to get on. The other thing, of course, in the Bible, it talks about Jerusalem being the centre of world war, doesn't it? Here's one place. This is Zechariah 12. I will make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink that makes the nearby nations stagger when they send their armies to besiege Jerusalem and Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem an, Im an immovable rock all the nations will gather against it to try and to move it, but they will only hurt themselves. There's a great big conflict coming over Jerusalem. You know, this is what's going to happen. Trump could, by tipping the balance with this, effectively start this whole thing moving, couldn't he? Because it says that Jerusalem's like an immovable rock. It's a burdensome stone, it says in the authorised version. In other words, if you start messing with Jerusalem, there could be trouble. And actually, if Trump moves things around, it could seriously spark something off, couldn't it? Happy with that one? The other one, of course, is Syria. Now, Trump has said a lot about Syria. This was a couple of days ago, Friday. This was uh, in the New York Times. This is what they said. President-elect Donald J. Trump said Friday that he was likely to abandon the American effort to support moderate opposition groups in Syria who are battling the government of President Bashar al-Assad, saying we have no idea who these people are. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal that dealt largely with economic issues, he repeated a position he took often during his campaign, that the United States should focus on defeating the Islamic State and find common ground with the Syrians and their Russian backers. In other words, let's do a deal with Russia, pretty much let them get on with it, we're just going to come out of uh, Syria and just pretty much leave them to it. So what does the Bible say about Syria? Well, we've looked at this loads of times. We know what's coming down the track with Syria. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 17 that Damascus is going to be taken away from being a city. So Trump thinks, I'm actually going to sort the situation of Syria, Syria out by just backing out and letting Russia do what it wants. Whatever he does, something is going to lead to Damascus ceasing to be a city. I don't know how it's going to happen, but something has got to happen for that to happen because God says it's going to happen. In, also in Isaiah 17 it says, and this is a few verses later, it says the fortified towns of Israel will also be destroyed and the royal power of Damascus will end. All that remains of Syria will share in the fate of Israel's departed glory, declares the Lord of Heaven's armies. In that day Israel's glory will grow dim, its robust body will waste away, the whole land will look like a grain field. So effectively... When Syria comes to an end as a nation and Damascus ceases, Israel has also got involved. So there's a war between that, 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 that's going to happen in Syria 
Israel's also going to be involved. So Trump is on a bit of a hiding to nothing. Something is going to happen in uh, Syria, despite or whatever Trump thinks he's going to do, this is still to happen. And we also read about these exact same events in, I, in Jeremiah 49. The message was given, this message was given concerning Damascus. This is what the Lord says. The towns of Hamath and Arpad are struck with fear. They have heard the news of their destruction. Their hearts are troubled like a wild sea in a raging storm. Damascus has become feeble. All her people turn to flee. Fear, anguish and pain have grip, gripped her as they grip a woman in labour. That famous city, a city of joy, will be forsaken. Her young men will fall in the streets and die. In that day her soldiers will all be killed, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, and I will set a fire to the walls of Damascus that will burn up the palaces of Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad is a, a title for the rulers of Syria. That's a pretty terrible uh, picture there of, again, Syria coming to an end, of Damascus coming to an end, and so on. So, all this is still to happen. Something is going to happen. Now, amazingly, of course, we've got here Hamath and Arpad. Hamath is modern-day Homs, and Arpad is Aleppo. Aleppo. We know that because Wikipedia, thankfully, tells us that Arpad is an ancient city in present-day Syria near Aleppo. And what's on the news all the time at the minute but Aleppo. And what has Russia done? But you know, you know, you know the um, aircraft carrier that it sent by our shores a couple of weeks ago? It arrived yesterday off the coast of Syria with other ships ready to attack Aleppo. Do you think these people are, what does it say? They are struck with fear for they've heard the news of their destruction. Would, if you were living in Aleppo and you knew all the forces of Russia had just arrived off the coast ready to hit you, would you be living in fear right now? If in Tewkesbury there was an armada of ships with cruise missiles and bombs and all sorts of things and they said, we're going to take you out, we wouldn't be sat here thinking, let's go and have a nice lunch later. We'd be saying, where the heck are we going to go? And if we were surrounded and couldn't get out, which is what they are, you would be living in fear. That today is what people are feeling in Aleppo. This is what's coming down the track. So, bombarded Aleppo lives in fear of siege and starvation. Hom, Syria, inside the city of fear. The Bible knew all of this thousands of years ago. It's happening right now. In fact, if you go on the BBC website, this is the map. This is what it shows you. Three cities highlighted. Aleppo, Homs, Damascus. The reason it highlights those in red is that they're the three, nation, the three cities that are the centres of the problem in Syria. They're the very three cities in Jeremiah 49 that God pulls out. How amazing is that? The last bit I was going to show you is relations with Iran. So the headline a couple of days ago is Iran nuclear deal could collapse under Trump. This is in the Washington Post a couple of days ago. The future of the historic nuclear agreement with Iran is in the air with the prospect that a Donald Trump administration could take steps that would cause Iran to abandon its commitments, experts said Wednesday. Some characterized Trump's election as a death knell for the deal which was reached in 2014 and put into effect in January. It imposes limits on Iran's nuclear program and its ability to build atomic weapons for at least 10 years in exchange for lifting most international sanctions. So what Trump is saying is, they get rid of it. I hate the deal. Did you hear him say that earlier? I hate this deal. It's the worst deal we've ever done. Get rid of it. So what is the Bible uh, saying about Iran and this uh, deal. Well, interestingly, it talks about the very deal. In Isaiah 21, it says, The burden of the desert of the sea, as whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it cometh from the desert from a terrible land. A grievous vision is declared unto me, the treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O media, all the sign thereof, I have made to cease. So God says, and this is all in the context of the last days, 
there is a treacherous deal done with a treacherous dealer. There's a deal done and it's treacherous. Now the question is, who is doing this deal and where is the deal done? Who are the players involved? The players involved are Elam and Media, clearly, because they're in the same verse as the treacherous deal. Yeah? There's a treacherous deal and Elam and Media are the people involved. Anybody know where Elam and Media are? Answer? Iran. Here's Elam in southwestern Iran, and Media is the rest of it. You heard of the Medes and the Persians. Yeah. Media is the Medes. The Medes were Iran, weren't they? The Persians. So actually, the, the treacherous deal is done by Iran. Now have a little look at this. Lots of verses in the Bible that talk about Iran being um, obsessed with bright arrows and attacking other nations and there being a treacherous deal. So they do a deal, but it's treacherous. In fact, they go against it. Now you can see with Trump coming in saying we're going to rip this up, they might themselves say, well, actually, if you're going to do that, we're going to go against the deal and actually throw everything at you. There's many verses in the Bible that talk about Persia being involved, aren't they? Not least of which, Ezekiel 38, that says the Persians, the Iranians, will join Russia in invading Israel. So we know that that is going to happen. So, you know, this man here is coming in, probably with many, many good intentions, extremely naive, I would suggest, in terms of the politics of the world and how it all operates. He thinks he can do a deal with Putin, the Bible says you're not going to do a deal because something's going to happen that is going to remain king of the north versus king of the south. You want to scrap the Iranian uh, thing, but actually what that's going to cause is Iran to actually, you know, forego the agreement and act treacherously against it and actually attack. You want to back Israel, that's a good thing in terms of backing Israel, but that then destabilizes Jerusalem and, uh, and the Middle East. And you can see that, you know, he's coming in thinking that his billions, uh, his business experience is going to sort this out. Actually, it could well lead to many of the things that we have been long looking for uh, coming into place. He wants to make America great again. The Bible says, actually, America's in quite a weak position at the time of the end. They don't even fight back against Russia when Russia invades. They just say, what are you doing? They've got nothing left in their armory. Interestingly, Time magazine last week had this <laughs> as its front cover. 
And I'm thinking to myself, the end probably is near. Time is ticking on. It can't be a coincidence that this man has come into power and everybody's feeling a bit destabilised. Destabilisation is exactly what we're probably heading towards. Um, so hopefully that's of interest because we, what we have to do in all of this is ignore the noise and keep focused on what God says are going to be the outcomes. So thanks for listening. Sorry I've gone over, but hopefully that was interesting. Mm -hmm.